Boost converters are one of the most fundamental power supply topologies in the step-up converter category. Like the name sounds, a boost converter is used when we want to take a lower voltage and boost it up to a higher voltage. In this video, we are going to do a comprehensive breakdown of the boost converter. Just like we did in our buck converters for beginners video, we will be analyzing the key components that make up the circuit, its operational modes, and other important theoretical concepts that you need to know in order to get a full understanding of how the boost converter works. The main goal with this video is to introduce you to the topology and give you a strong understanding of the fundamentals before we start getting our hands dirty with some actual design work. There will be some later videos in this series where we go through the full design process step by step, but for right now, we're just getting started. And with that being said, Let's just jump right into it. So the first thing I want to do is open up TI's Power Topologies Handbook to the Boost Converter section. There we'll see the circuit diagram that is referred to as the Boost Converter's power stage, which is basically the collection of components that do all of the heavy lifting, that do the actual work in converting the lower voltage to the higher voltage. First, let's focus on Q1, the MOSFET. Its primary role in the boost converter topology is to act as a switch that connects the inductor L1 to ground. When the MOSFET is switched on, it essentially acts as a short or very low impedance pathway to ground for current to flow through the inductor. Conversely, when it's in its off state, it allows current to flow through the inductor to the output load through the diode D1. Now at first glance, it may not seem super obvious why we would want to connect the inductor to ground through the MOSFET, but when we get into the operational modes later on in this video, we'll see why this is actually a genius idea. When selecting the MOSFET for a boost converter application, there are several key parameters that you'll want to be familiar with. They are things such as the drain to source voltage rating, the current rating, the power dissipation rating, and the general performance of the part. But don't worry if these terms aren't super familiar to you yet. We will go over them when we start doing actual design work in some later videos. So next up, we have the inductor L1. One of the key concepts that you need to understand whenever you're learning about how a boost converter works is the inherent property that inductors have where they like to resist any changes in current flowing through them. That means when the MOSFET Q1 is turned on, the current through the inductor will start to ramp up linearly as opposed to there being a very rapid current spike. Another important concept to understand with inductors is that they can store energy in their magnetic field. We will see this come into play whenever we show some circuit simulations later on in this video. There are several key parameters that we want to be familiar with when we're talking about the inductors. They are things such as the inductance value, which is essentially a measure of how strong the inductor is, i.e. how strongly it will resist any changes in current flowing through it. Your RMS current rating, which is just a current, which is just a rating of the average amount of current the inductor can have flowing through it. And then something like your saturation current rating, which is the point at which the inductor stops becoming an inductor. So you never want to exceed this value in your application. The next component is the output capacitor. This component works with the inductor to store and release energy. Its job is to help smooth out the output voltage so we get a nice clean signal and something that doesn't have like a lot of noise or a lot of like ripple in it. This is something that's actually very important when it comes to designing switch mode power supplies, and we'll actually touch on it in later videos. When selecting an output capacitor for a boost converter application, the parameters that you'll want to be familiar with are things like your capacitor's voltage rating, its capacitance value, equivalent series resistance, and ripple current rating. The next component we're going to talk about is going to be the input capacitor. And that component performs a similar function to the output capacitor. It helps smooth out any of the input voltage spikes that are caused by the switching of the MOSFET so that the regulator has a clean signal to work with. Keep in mind that we also don't want any noise that is originated from the power supply to propagate back upstream to our input voltage source. So the input capacitor kind of serves a dual function in that it filters out noise coming from our input voltage source and also filters out noise coming from our boost converter itself. When selecting an input capacitor, the parameters you want to be familiar with are going to be the exact same as the output capacitor. And last on our list is going to be D1, the rectifier diode. At first glance, it may not seem super obvious why we even need a diode in this circuit because there's basically a straight shot from our input voltage source to our output voltage. 
and it's not really clear like what role that the diode serves. But one key thing that you have to keep in mind is that the with a boost converter, your output voltage is going to be higher than your input voltage. And as we all know, current likes to flow from a point of higher potential down to lower potential. So if that rectifier diode weren't there, what would end up happening is current would be flowing backwards because the voltage on the output is higher. So with the rectifier diode there, that prevents that from happening since it only allows current to flow in one direction. When selecting a rectifier diode for a boost converter application, you'll wanna be familiar with parameters such as your reverse breakdown voltage, your current rating, your forward voltage, and your power dissipation rating. We'll cover all of these in a later video, so don't worry again if you're just getting started with this. And that covers all of the components in the boost converter's power stage. Now let's talk about the theory of operations of a boost converter. To understand how this circuit works, we're going to take the same approach that we did in the buck converters video and analyze the circuit under two different conditions. One is when the MOSFET is on, and the other is when the MOSFET is off. Okay, so the first condition that we're gonna analyze the circuit under is when the MOSFET is on. So as we mentioned earlier, when the MOSFET is on, the inductor is effectively shorted to ground or connected to ground through a very low impedance. As a result, current begins to flow from the input voltage source through the inductor and through the MOSFET to ground. During this time, no current flows from the input voltage source through the load. And as we mentioned earlier, it's important to understand that the inductor is going to resist any changes to the amount of current flowing through it. So rather than seeing an immediate current spike, Instead, what we'll see is just a gradual linear increase in the amount of current flowing through the inductor. This phase of the operation is what's known as the charging phase, and this is when the inductor will start to store energy in its magnetic field. And that's pretty much it on the charging phase. It's actually a pretty simple part of the phase. The next one, which is going to be when the MOSFET's off, uh, there's a lot more stuff going on that we want to cover. So when we turn the MOSFET off, the inductor will no longer be shorted to ground and the only available pathway for current to flow will be through the rectifier diode and then through the load. And as we mentioned several times before, the inductor will want to resist any changes in current flowing through it. So what it's going to do is start to release that energy that it stored during the charging phase in order to keep the current flowing through it the same. The only difference is that now we're connected to the load resistance as opposed to that very tiny resistance that was provided by the MOSFET. So what ends up happening is we will actually generate a higher voltage drop across the output due to Ohm's law. Just remember V equals IR. And if your current stays the same, but your load resistance increases, then you're gonna get a higher voltage on the output. And that's the magic of the boost converter. It's simply harnessing Ohm's law and the fact that inductors like to resist any changes in current flowing through them to generate that higher output voltage. I think it's super interesting to see how just simply rearranging some of the components in the buck converter circuit will yield a completely different outcome and behavior and you know perform a completely different function for us. So I want to go over some key takeaways from the demonstration of the operational modes to kind of hopefully help cement your understanding of how the boost converter works. So number one is we are using the MOSFET to create a very low impedance pathway for the input voltage source to push current through the inductor. This is what allows us to ramp our current up to a very high level that it, the input voltage source would not otherwise be able to generate if it were simply connected directly to our output load because that has a much higher resistance than the MOSFET drain to source resistance. Then when the MOSFET is switched off, the inductor will continue to push that high current that was just flowing through it through the MOSFET it's now gonna push that same current or try to push that same current through our load. And as a result, the voltage has no choice but to increase just because of Ohm's law. And then the last key point here is, just like in the case with the buck converter, we can finally control the average current flowing through the inductor by switching the MOSFET on and off in a certain pattern, in a certain with a certain duty cycle, right? And as a result, you can finally control the current flowing through your load, and therefore you can you know, effectively control the voltage drop across your output. And in this case, 
it's gonna be some higher voltage. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is run some more demonstrations to explain some other important parts of how the circuit operates. So the first thing I wanna talk about is how the boost converter um, works during startup. Before the MOSFET starts switching, we can see that our input voltage source is essentially connected directly to our load through the inductor through the diode. So initially, we will see our output voltage as being equal to our input voltage. Then, once we turn the MOSFET on, we will see the current through the inductor start to ramp up. But during this time, we will see the output voltage start to sag a little and decay because our input voltage source is no longer going to be pushing current through it. All of the current is flowing through the inductor and through the MOSFET now. By simply monitoring both the input current, i.e. the current flowing through our inductor, and the output voltage, we can determine what our average current through the inductor needs to be to achieve whatever our desired output voltage is going to be. So we can do something like turn the MOSFET on until we get to that calculated current value and then switch it off and let the inductor start pushing current through the load. This is where we will see the voltage drop across the load actually step up to the higher value. Once we get to our desired output voltage, we will then transition into what I will refer to as the steady state behavior of the circuit. This is the repeated cycle of turning the MOSFET on and off in order to finally control the average current flowing through the inductor and thus the average current flowing through our load, which is ultimately proportional to the voltage drop across our load. One thing that's important to pay attention to with the steady state behavior of the boost converter is how long the MOSFET stays on, which is also known as the duty cycle of the MOSFET. There is actually an equation you can use to determine what your uh, required duty cycle is for the boost converter. Um, and this is something we'll actually talk about in later videos because it can be pretty critical to your design and understanding and how this metric kind of impacts your design. Alrighty, so now I want to talk about some frequently asked questions that I often see when I'm you know, explaining to people how the boost converter works. So number one is going to be, what happens if the switch stays closed forever? And we kind of already covered this in the steady state operation whenever we talked about you know how the circuit's configured. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the input voltage source is connected directly to the output load. So if the MOSFET never switched on that's what would happen is you just get no step up you don't your your voltage doesn't get boosted up at all okay and then in that same vein the next question is so what happens if the switch stay is closed forever and this one's kind of interesting to look at so if you think about it if the mosfet switch stays closed forever that means the inductor will be connected to ground or shorted to ground so in theory your current will just keep ramping up you know, to infinity, right? But in real life, what would likely happen is your input voltage source would become shorted to ground and probably go into some sort of short circuit protection mode and would likely just kill itself, right? It would just drop out. And then what's really critical to understand is if you're using that input voltage source as like a power bus or if it's powering other circuits, that could be extremely problematic because a malfunctioning boost converter can just kill your whole your whole board, right? So it's very important to understand that um, aspect when designing that, yeah, you have to be careful to not let that happen and do run a lot of tests in order to ensure that this isn't gonna happen or else it could have very, you know, catastrophic consequences. Okay, so the next question is, uh, what happens if there is a change in load? So going back to our steady state operation, Pretty much all we would have to do is just let the current through the inductor ramp up to whatever required value we need again in order to maintain that specified output voltage. So it all goes back to Ohm's law at the end of the day. If you have a specified output voltage and your load resistance changes, then that just means your current through the load has to change. And as a result, your current through the inductor will have to change, right? because the current th flowing through the inductor is proportional to the current flowing through our load. And then lastly, this is my favorite question. Is there a limit to how high you can boost your output voltage? Now, what I would say is in theory, the answer is no, but practically in real life, the answer is yes. Uh, one area I would like to draw your attention to is going to be what we talked about earlier with the equation for the duty cycle, right? So basically what you'll understand is 
that is that the higher the ratio between the output voltage and input voltage, the closer to one your duty cycle will be. So essentially, if you wanted to boost your voltage from like one volt to 100 volts, you're like 0 0.99999 will be your duty cycle or something like that, right? And you'll, you'll get to the point where there are physical limitations to how high of a duty cycle these regulators can reliably deliver. But you'll see a lot of regulators have a maximum duty cycle limitation that is specified by the manufacturer. So that basically effectively limits the ratio that you can boost your voltage to. Fortunately, there are other ways of boosting your voltage using something like a transformer will work. And we'll actually cover that in our next video when we talk about the flyback converter and we'll get introduced to transformers. But if you need to boost your voltage significantly higher than some ratio such as like three to one or five to one, then you can start using something like a transformer maybe. And that'll give you a lot more room to boost your voltage up. Okay, cool. So now I just kind of want to review the stuff that we learned in this video and hopefully try to kind of really make things all connect for you now. So for me, the eureka moment and understanding how the boost converter works is understanding that one, the average current through our inductor is proportional to the average current through our load. The voltage drop across our load has to follow Ohm's law, that is V equals IR, where I is going to be proportional to the current through the inductor and R is going to be the resistance of our load. Shorting the inductor to ground through the MOSFET is what allows our input voltage to generate those high currents, which is what is required to generate that higher output voltage. So I hope that makes sense to you. I really tried to make this video sound very similar to the buck converter because I think these two circuits are kind of two halves of the same coin. They both rely on some of the same fundamental principles of your inductor and Ohm's law and stuff like that. So hopefully if you can kind of understand one, it helps cement your understanding of the other. And that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to talk about in this video. Thank you so much if you made it to the end and hopefully I will see you in the next one.